one of the things that we need to do is we need to learn how to trust in the words that God gives us. In fact, trusting God's words is a challenge. When God told Abram, fear not, it wasn't just Abram God was speaking to. He's speaking through him to us, and he says to us, fear not. So we have to take God's word. This is the challenge. We take God's word, his fear not, and bring it to our fears. That's where we trust. When Jesus said, peace be still, it wasn't just to the storm he was talking to or the disciples who were in the middle of a storm. When he says, peace be still, we take his words and bring it to our storm. And the challenge is to see that God performs just like his word says. As Andre Crouch sings, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. That's what trusting in his word is all about. It's a challenge. Paul was told he was going to stand before the Roman emperor and give his testimony, but he was in a boat. And the boat that he was in was shipwrecked. And he landed on an island marooned. And Paul was challenged now to believe what God said. He said, will God keep what he said. And the reason why Paul is in God's word and we read so much about him is because he learned to trust in Jesus. He learned to trust in God. Trusting God's words is a challenge. The scripture says in Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Notice it says now. This is something we need to do now, not tomorrow, but now. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you're hoping for it, it means you don't have it. You're believing for it. That's where the challenge comes in. I'm believing for something that I don't have right now. It's the evidence of things not seen. That's an incredible statement. The evidence of things I cannot see, that is a paradox. And I noticed that all life revolves around paradoxes. For instance, the more you know, is the more that you know you don't know. That's a paradox. Banks will lend you money if you have money, but they won't lend you money if you don't have money. That's a paradox. You know, it's interesting that stupid people know everything and intelligent people know that they don't know. They don't even know 1% of what it is they would like to know. That's a paradox. And we live in a paradox today. God has given us faith, and it's the evidence of things not seen, yet by the eyes of faith, we're willing to see what cannot be seen with our naked eyes. Now, in our culture, faith is bypassed. And they emphasize logic and reason. Now, there's nothing wrong with reason. There's nothing wrong with logic. We ought to be logical. We ought to be reasonable when we, we do things. But, but if we're not careful, logic and reason can be perverted and can be twisted until it's so out of shape you don't recognize it anymore. I'll give you a couple of examples. The Supreme Court bypassed the law, thou shalt not kill. And they embraced the rule, you can have an abortion. That's killing. But that's logic and that's their reason. These are intellectual reasoning. And sometimes reasoning can, you know, you know some, we live in a sanctuary state. Look at this. We're in a sanctuary state. And you walk down the streets of San Francisco or Los Angeles, you run into uh, drug paraphernalia, you ru run into human feces, you run into criminals that are being protected, you run into rats that are multiplying and diseases that are spreading, but don't use plastic straws. That's reason. That's reason perverted. 
what they do is they they release violent criminals onto the streets and then they handcuff the police officers so they can't do the job that they're supposed to do. That That's the kind of reason it gets kind of twisted. We seem to be very uncomfortable with language. And in fact, there's, there's a movement going on that we uh, change the language that we use. And you should not refer to people if you're using their gender. For instance, don't say he or him or her or Mrs. or Miss or Mr. because that's identifying their biological gender. So you have to be a little bit more like, hey, you. <laughs> hey, person. They're, they're against man and woman. Manhattan needs to be called personhattan. That's the world that we live in. And not only that, but they, they soften the language up so you don't call him a burglar, you just say he's possession challenged. He's not assaulting anybody, he's just rumbling, a rumbling expert. He just, uh, that's the world we live in. They take reason and they take logic and they twist it out of shape so you don't even recognize it anymore. Let me give you an example. In Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What that means is that in the beginning, God created chemistry. He created biology. He created physics. He created gravity. And he created the intricate laws of the laws of nature. But the college professor will tell you it's an accident. They're really pushing reasoning so far that you don't even recognize it when you see it. And, and I, I want to show you something. Surrounding this planet, there is a layer of ozone, a thin layer of gas called ozone. That layer of gas is there to filter out the rays of ultraviolet and infrared, two deadly rays of the sun, that if the ozone layer was not there and it would penetrate into our atmosphere, it would kill everything that's alive on Earth. It's amazing. But God put that ozone out there because what it does is it filters those two deadly rays so that when they are filtered and they come to Earth, they actually promote life. They enhance life. And that's an accident. If you compressed ozone, it would be the thickness of two pennies placed on top of each other. That's how thin it is. Brothers and sisters, that is no accident. I believe God. And it takes faith to believe what God says. But when he says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, I'd rather believe what God is saying than what all of man's reason. In fact, when, when the scripture says this, it says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. And the foolishness of God is wisdom. It's, it's as if it, God's worst day is better than man's best day, and God doesn't have a worst day. God is wisdom. God is all-powerful. God is ever-present. God is all-knowing. He always is. So it's not really that hard for me to believe I can put my trust in what it is that God is saying. It's, it's not an accident. When, when God created man, God says he, he, he formed man out of the, the mud, the dirt. He made man out of dirt. The college professor will tell you that it's an accident. What is evolution? Oh, no, no, God didn't just make man out of the dirt. It was a long process of time, uh, thousands and thousands, millions and millions of years. It started off as a plant cell, became an amoeba, and then orangutan, and then it kept on going until finally it became man. That's what they tell us. In fact, what they tell us in our schools, our liberal schools, is if you give anything enough time, it's just a matter, if you give it time, Time can produce just about anything. If you believe that, then you believe that the wristwatch on your wrist just suddenly accidentally came together. And they also say that if you get a couple of monkeys and put them on a typewriter and give them enough years, they will eventually be able to type out Shakespeare's works. I don't think so. 
I think it's a lot better for us to learn how to put our trust in God, to believe him. And so we learn how to trust God's word. And it's, it's, it's not something that is ethereal or something that is just philosophical or something that is out there somewhere. Trusting God's word is for the things that we live with daily. That's why if God says, fear not, I got to bring his fear not into my fear. That's why when, when Jesus says, peace be still, I got to learn how to bring his peace into the anxiety that I'm facing. Now to get into the scripture, in the 15th chapter of Genesis, God speaks to Abraham and he says, then God said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, the Chaldeans, to give you this land to inherit it. Abram thought about that for a while, then he asked God a question I would have asked him, and, and he said, Lord, God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And let me give you the reasoning why Abraham said this. He could have said, Lord, 10 years ago, you told me I was going to have a promised child. I still don't have that promised child. Now you're telling me I'm going to inherit the land. How am I supposed to know that? I mean, I just, I just, I'm just asking a question. How do I need to know that? And so God, what God did is God told Abraham to make a sacrifice. Now let me explain something about this ancient sacrifice. In those days, when two people had an agreement to make, that was important. What they would do is they would take animals and they would cut them up and they would place them on the ground and then it would be a blood sacrifice and then both parties would pass through the sacrifice promising to keep their word. That's the way those ancient covenants were made. To, to bring you up today, somewhat like the mafia today when they induct somebody into the family they bring him into a room, it's a dark room, they grab the round inner circle, they prick his finger, blood starts coming down from his finger, and he is made to say something to the effect, may my blood be spilled if I dishonor this family. It's a blood covenant. And in some sense, that's what God asked Abraham to do. Get the animals, cut them up, and so Abraham prepared the sacrifice where God was going to walk through, and as he was preparing the sacrifice, this is what the scripture says. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now, when you read a story like this, you say, what is in the world does that mean? I mean, what, uh, birds, birds coming down on a, uh, uh, what does it mean to me? I live in, uh, uh, I live in this day and age. Uh, uh, what am I supposed to get out of that? This, those birds were trying to interfere with the covenant that God was making with Abraham. Those birds were trying to take away the blessing that God was going to bring Abraham. Those birds were coming to take away the gift that God was planning to give Abraham, and it's our job to keep the birds away. Some, some of us think, well, you know, I, I thought since I became a Christian, I'm, I've been immune to these kind of things. But no, no, we're not immune. We have got to be constantly on guard against the birds that want to steal the word of God when God's word comes to us. And it could possibly be that when the word of God comes to us today, if it falls on hard soil, you can be sure that the birds are going to come and pick it up. Jesus told a story about the sower and the seed, and he says some of the seed fell on the wayside and the seed that fell on the wayside the birds came and they devoured them later jesus explaining this parable says those birds represented the messengers of satan jesus said that the thief comes but to steal to kill to destroy the enemies are after everything that god wants to give us and so those birds represent the, the forces of the enemy that want to come and take away the blessing that God has for you, the, 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 the ministry that God has for you, the promises that God has for you, he wants to remove them, he wants to take them away. And if your hard heart is there when the word comes, you can be sure the birds are on the sidelines just waiting for the seed to fall and they're going to pluck that promise up they, because the enemy comes to steal what God has come to give us. Now, we don't always 
recognize the birds. Sometimes birds come, they don't come in the form of birds. This is just a figurative expression in scripture. Even though it literally happened with Abraham, we got to understand it in a figurative sense that the birds sometimes come and we don't recognize them as birds. When Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah, he did not realize figuratively the birds were circling overhead and they were planning to take away the blessings that God had given Lot. He would find out soon enough and all of the possessions that he had were going to be taken away. The birds are standing and waiting and circling, trying to take away blessings that God wants us to have. He wants to interfere with the marriage. He wants to interfere with the relationship. He wants to interfere with your career. He wants to interfere with your business. He wants to interfere with your life. And the birds are out there trying, and we don't always understand that they really are birds out there, figuratively speaking, that are coming to try to destroy us. Samson didn't see see the bird because Samson only saw an angel of light. He saw Delilah wiggling when she walked with coquettish eyes. And so he was looking at her not realizing that there were birds. That was a bird, a bird. That was a bird coming to destroy the ministry that God had given him. And when it was all over, he lost his eyesight. It's a bird. The scriptures are always given to us in order to help us understand some spiritual truth. I remember the first spiritual truth that I learned from my mother. She read us the story of David and Goliath, and I was fascinated by the fact that a little kid, I thought of him as a kid, took on a big man and with a stone brought him down. During the day, sometime during that day, I had an argument with my brother. And my mother came into the room, pointed her finger at me, said, kill it, kill it. I said, kill what? <laughs> what? What kill? She said, you're angry. It's the giant. Kill it. And that was the first time I realized that the stories in the Bible are not stories just to entertain us. The stories in the Bible are there to help us understand something about our lives. When anger flares up, it's just another way of saying the birds are coming to take away your peace of mind. That's what the scripture is teaching, and that's what I figured out. So whenever peace is attacked in your life and in my life, I like, when peace is being attacked, it's an attack of the birds. The birds are attacking. And just as Abraham drove those birds away, we need to learn how to drive the forces that try to steal our peace away. And, and I want to give you a passage of scripture so I could bring it down to earth. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. With thanksgiving. It's the act of being thankful. At a time when you're anxious, at a time when you're worried, at a time when you're gloomy, at a time when you feel depressed, you see, when, when that comes through prayer and supplication and with thanks is something about thanksgiving that drives away anxiety. Now you say, what in the world does thanksgiving have to do with anxiety, you will never know unless you do it. That's why I opened up by saying we need to learn to trust God's words. It's a challenge. And so this becomes a challenge. The challenge is the next time your peace is stolen for whatever reason, consider it a bird that you got to drive away. And the way you drive that bird away is by taking a little time out to be thankful to the Lord. God inhabits the praises of his people. Now something happens in scripture. While Abram is driving these birds away that are trying to take away his sacrifice, it becomes evening. He's been doing it all day long. It's now the evening. And as scripture says now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. That's a paradox. 
Because one minute he's fighting the birds and the next minute God wants him to go to sleep. But you can't fight birds and drive them away if you're sleeping. That's a paradox. And you'll find that paradox is so often in God's word. For instance, at banks, they will lend you money if you have money, but they won't lend you money if you don't have money. That's a paradox. And, and God wants us to learn how to fight because we've got to maintain what it is that God has given us. And the birds are going to come and try to take it. But there comes a time, listen, there comes a time when God says, sleep on it. I want you to let go of what you've been doing because it's out of your control. And I want you to sleep on it. Listen to this. Sometimes you have to let go. And you have to turn it over to God. And God sends a little lullaby to say, sleep on this thing. You can't fight this. This is a job for God. There are some things that we go through that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Things that are beyond us. We put all of our energy and effort and our logic and our reason to try to get this thing worked out, but we realize that we've come against a brick wall. And when we come against that brick wall, it's God's way of saying, sleep on it. And while you're sleeping, God will be working. I want to play this thing again, and I, I want us to sing the words to this song. You may not know that there are words written, recently written to this song, The Lullaby, and uh, it's way beyond my range. So I'm going to kneel down over here and ask Nancy Ann as she comes in, since it's her birthday, uh, she could come and, and help me sing it. And I want you to look at the words, and I want you to sing them with us if you can. Go to sleep. Let the Lord come and heal you. Give it up to the Lord. He will help you make it right. He's in control of your life. He will never, ever leave. You can count on his word. He will do just what you heard. I told Nancy, I'm going to give you credit for this. I can't take. I don't write songs. Joey was just a little kid. When one Christmas we bought him a, a football helmet. And he wanted a helmet. And he went to sleep that night holding on to the helmet. And later on at night when we tiptoed into the room, his hands were off the helmet while he was sleeping. Because you can't sleep and hold on to something. If you're going to sleep, you have to let go. And maybe God is speaking to you today and saying, you're holding on to something you really can't hold on to. I want you to go to sleep. You got to let this thing go. Let it be. Let it be. Hear the words of wisdom. Let it be. Let it. Isn't it true that there's sometimes things that are so far beyond us, we don't have the ability to think our way through it. This is not a matter of reason and logic. It's a matter of I got to have faith in God. And God puts Abram to sleep because now it's God's business to take care of his business. And Abraham goes to sleep. He did his best chasing the birds away, but now it was time for, for him to let God do the rest. And while he was sleeping, this is what happened. 
And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. That was the presence of God passing between the pieces. What is interesting about this is that Abram was sleeping when God passed through the sacrifice, which means God did not need Abraham to be with him when he made the promise that the land was going to be his. God was saying, with or without you, Abraham, I'm making a promise that is going to come to pass based on my word, and I swear by my own word that it will come to pass. There are times when we just got to relax and let God do what God needs to do because the scripture says, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. And if that's true, it's so that we can sleep. And while we sleep, God does his work. I know there's an issue happening uh, right now with, with Hannah Tucker, who's, who's in the hospital. And doctors don't seem to know what the issue is. And they're doing all of their tests, and they're coming back with negative reports, and everything is fine, and, but there's still a problem that they can't get their hands on. And it's times like that, it's times like that, when God wants us to put it in his hands. We can't control some things. And when we can't control it, we have to turn it over to him. Let God go and let God have his way. And maybe he needs to have his way in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your business, in your career. There's something that you just can't handle by yourself and God is simply saying, Go to sleep. Let me handle this. Let go of it. God's got control of it. And God will take it through to victory. There's a, there's a song that we sing so many times. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. There are things that attack our peace. There are anxieties that come. There are fears that come. There are worries that come. There are things that come and they try to depress us. They try to discourage us. They try to distract us. It's the birds. We drive them away. And then we come before God and say, Lord, I've done everything I can do. There's nothing else I can do. So I present myself to you. Come with your peace. Sweep over my soul. Do what's impossible for me. I'm taking it out of my hands. It's difficult sometimes to let go of it, but I'm taking it out of my hands. I'm putting it in your hands. I need to sleep on it. This altar is open. I'll be glad to pray with you as you come. Peace, peace. Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love.